Welcome back to the Uncommon Cast, everyone. Hey, if you are new here, we'll give a quick introduction to the us. I'm Ryan. I'm Pam. I'm Dawn. And I'm Cody. And we are so excited to be at the table again. And today we have a very special guest that we are excited to introduce to you. Um, His name is Carlos Whitaker. He is an author, a speaker, a uh, purveyor of hope. And um, we are so excited that he is here with us. And Carlos, um, just to give you a little bit about who we are at Uncommon Good, we are basically a a band of vagabonds (laughs) traveling the world, trying to reclaim some truth about life, faith, and being human. We want to create a space for everybody at the table to engage in what we see as this life-giving hope that is available, but sometimes feels inaccessible. So Mm. we are working hard to try to make it feel more accessible for people. And we see you doing exactly that. And that's why we wanted to have you here with us this morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks guys for having me. I'm honored to, uh, to find some other people looking for hope in humanity. So it's it's what I do. It's what I try to do every single day. And um, this should be fun. So thanks for having me. Giddy up. You actually sparked us. We were in the audience at Catalyst West, I don't know, what, four four years years ago? Yeah, it was four years ago, And we got to hear you speak at that. And uh, obviously, you just uh, sparked our hearts. So it's a joy for us to connect with you now, man. Oh, so cool. So cool. Thanks for for letting me hang out in San Diego for a few minutes where you guys are at. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome to come to our spaceship-looking studio anytime. I'm in, dude. No, I'm in. I mean, for for those that aren't watching on YouTube or whatever, I mean, these guys have this thing set up. Like, the camera angle I'm looking at looks like you guys are about to take off. It's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) We are. Just wait. (laughs) Well, hey, we, one, we thought with everything that's been going on in your life that this podcast wasn't going to happen, or we were definitely going to have to put it off. And obviously we would have been fine with that. But, um, we just got through, we just got through Easter weekend where so many people celebrate resurrection, a coming back to life. And, um, so many people in the Christian, you know, umbrella celebrate good Friday, which is a, a death of things, a death of Jesus. And, and, uh, you yourself are, you and your family, brother, we've been following. Um, you have had a gnarly couple of weeks where you have experienced your own Good Friday, your own death of things, your own death of loved ones, your own turmoil mm. and tragedy in life. And yet also coming to just a couple of days ago, it has been unreal to follow the resurrection in a sense mm-hmm. um, that you and your family have been able to see about a community that supported you. So I wondered, just in a brief recap, can you tell us about your death and resurrection that you've just been through over the past few weeks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we're you know, we're a family of, just so, so there's some context for some of your listeners, a family mm-hmm, yeah. of five that live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and I, I live pretty, um, I live pretty openly on Instagram. Like people mm-hmm. have kind of, that have followed me for the last, honestly, for the last like 15 years online in some way, shape or form, whether it be, I had a blog for those of you that don't even remember what those things are. That was like before <laughs> people had video cameras and like, we would just write things. Right. And so, uh, I've had a YouTube channel for like a decade. People kind of followed my family. Uh, and then on Instagram, I've, I've lived pretty uh, in front and out loud of people, in front of people for, for a while now. And so, um, you know, we kind of show the good and the bad and the in between, and, uh, I have no shame showing the bad. And so about, uh, oh man, well, I don't even know where, where we're at now. I don't know what's up, down, what left, time? right, but it was, it was about, <laughs> yeah, it was about two weeks ago, uh, maybe a week and a half ago. Um, we, um, were, well, actually I'll, I'll back up to even Thursday of that week. My daughter, nobody really knows this yet. My daughter, um, was in a car accident. And so that kind of woke us up like at, uh, like at 7 AM. She's like, on my way to work. She's on her way to work. She has a car accident. So have to deal with that all day long. That kind of shook us a little bit as, as a family, cause it could have been a lot worse. And then, uh, that was Thursday. And then Friday I had like this super deep emotional kind of reconciliation conversation with one of my best friends on planet earth to where it's just exhausting. One of those exhausting, mm-hmm. uh, emotionally exhausting conversations mm-hmm. where you're putting everything on the line. Yeah. Um, but it ends up be like working out and things are good. And so like, I would say like after those two days, like I'm already like, man, like this is, I'm going to remember this week. Like this mm-hmm. week was like, was intense. Like in 2021, <laughs> this was a, an intense week. 
And I, little did I know my week hadn't even started. Right. <laughs> You're um, just so, ramping up at this point. Uh, yeah. And then so Saturday, um, we get about 11 inches of rain in Nashville in 24 hours. And for people that aren't used to rain or understand what that is, that is like, <laughs> that's the most rain that, that we've ever had in the history of recorded rainfall in Nashville. And so Nashville floods, houses flood, mine's one of the houses that floods. And so you know, uh, our house floods, we're, we're taking everything to the second story, trying to save as much as we can, but we're losing a lot in the basement as water's kind of rushing in. And, you know, we're up till 4 a.m. just trying to get everything safe and up and get all the memories and the VHS tapes off the floor and moving yeah. sofas. And it was just exhausting. And then, <laughs> so then I, I, that was Saturday night, Sunday morning or Sunday, I drive to Atlanta and, um, I'm, I do do I have some work in Atlanta to do. Heather calls me and says, "Hey, Pope, our dog. Uh, he's not he's not looking too hot. He got into the compost, which he does every once in a while. And we're like, okay, you know, like he normally gets in the compost. He feels like crap for a couple of days and then he bounces back. So Monday I get back, um, and he's he's not doing good. So Monday night we take him to the ER, like around seven. And, um, to the vet ER and the doctors, you know, they do x-rays, they do all the things. And they're like, looks like he's just got a bad case of gastritis, you know? So that was like, honestly, a pretty penny chunk out of our sure. wallet to just find out that he would have yeah. been fine had we yeah. not taken him. So that's, you know, so now I'm just telling you, I'm just exhausted at this point. <laughs> oh like, I'm just gosh. like, Lord have mercy. Like what, what is happening? We kind of felt like, oh, so the next morning I'm actually in the middle of recording a podcast with somebody else. Um, they're interviewing me and my wife comes running in and, um, and she is in tears and <laughs> we've got chickens. Okay. And her favorite chicken that she had been, it's our newest chicken that she, we got as a little chick a couple months ago. She'd been slowly introducing it to the family of chickens. Well, somehow it got out of the coop and an owl, <laughs> a great horned freaking owl had <laughs> bombed the chicken killed the chicken oh but God. we had we had some yarn set up like over over the chicken coop to where the chickens can't fly out well little did we know that it was actually it actually this owl got tangled up in all the yarn so heather goes out there and sees her dead chicken but then sees the owl that killed it but the owl is trapped and so we have to spend the next two hours oh. freeing the murderer owl uh <laughs> from the from the yarn Right next to the dead chicken. So, you know, at this point, it's like, oh, my gosh, what else could go wrong? It was at this point that my friend Megan actually texted and is like, are you watching what's happening <laughs> with Carlos <laughs> on totally. Instagram? Oh, <laughs> because man. we're all friends. You didn't yeah. know. But yeah. she's like, check in with Carlos. Stuff mm -hmm. is going down. <laughs> yeah. 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 So stuff's going down. We rescue the owl. It's actually pretty badass. My wife's like holding the owl. Yeah, she's like, crazy. she's Wild. got no gloves on. And this owl is just letting my wife hold her. It's the craziest thing. You know, every, every like animal expert that follows me on Instagram, which surprisingly I have many, <laughs> zoos and those things, are your people, you know, <laughs> you know, and they're like, they're like, I can't believe that she, that, that owl did not put four inches of gashes in her arms. Like, like just the wow. claws on those things, oh. but no, just let her kind of do it. And we take it to a rescue. Everyone is DMing, you know, one of your guests, Sharon uh, McMahon, and they're like telling her, oh, my gosh, you got to go rescue Carlos's owl because, you know, they think because she likes wildlife, she must be a professional. And she's <laughs> clearly. <a national>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, clearly. So, we, you know, we kind of had fun with that. I did a live with her and then whatever. So we get home from taking the owl to a wildlife rescue place and Pope, our dog, is just not doing well, like he's he's kind of getting worse. And so Heather's, Heather's like, you know, I'm going to take him back to the vet. You stay here because we can take him back and not have to pay anything extra if we take him within 24 hours. So mm -hmm. she took him back and um, kind of dropped him off. And the doctor's like, well, let's take another look at him. So we're we're we have some friends bringing us over dinner. Like, I mean, we're already at the place where people are bringing us dinner. Right. Like right. we've already had that kind of week where. <laughs> yeah. We're like in a food train already, right? Like people are already <laughs> bringing us dinner. They're you, already, yeah. <laughs> we're already emotionally taxed. And so we have some friends over, they brought us over some food, having dinner. And then the the vet calls and I answer the phone and it's the doctor. And, um, and she's like, well, um, so I'm, I'm just going to be frank with you. And when she said that, you <laughs> no. know, like 
all of our oh. guts just drop. Oh. And, you know, long story short, Pope, was, his uh, liver was failing. And there was a, there were, she's like, there's things that still can be done. But at this point, she started adding up what could be done. And we're, we're talking, honestly, we're talking $15,000. Like, like we're talking wow. like, mm-hmm. and I mean, I love that dog, but it's just not, it's, it's just not feasible, you know? And I was the only one ready to mortgage the house to save the dog, right? <laughs> Everybody else was like, Aww. listen, like, like he's, he's seven Bernese mountain dogs only live to about eight or nine. Oh, wow. Um, you know, we've had a good life. We, we, it was just, it was hard. It was one of the most gut wrenching decisions ever. Yeah. And so we, um, we make the horrible decision and drive to the vet and we say goodbye. And so, you know, the family leaves, I'm in the room uh, as we say goodbye to him and I'm, I'm kind of the last one there with him. And it's just, it's just gutting. Now, all this to say, we have to leave the next morning to go to Den fly to Denver because I'm, I'm preaching at a church on Sunday. And so we decided, you know, weeks ago that, Hey, we're going to go to Breckenridge for just a couple of days of relaxation. Little did we know how bad we needed it. We didn't know it was going to come at such a, so it's midnight. Everyone gets home. We're packing. We have to leave at like three 30 AM. Cause we're on the 5 AM flight. Um, so we don't get any sleep. We're exhausted. Oh my god. We pack, we're crying the whole way to the airport. We're crying, walking through TSA. Everyone's just mourning Pope. And we get on the plane. We fly to Atlanta. We're, we have to run in Atlanta to catch our next flight to Denver. As we're going down one of the escalators in Terminal A, Heather's at the bottom of the escalator. At the top, I'm at the top, and there's a guy right in front of me that drops his away suitcase, like his luggage. And I see him like trying to grab it. Somehow it slips out of his hand. This is no, this is not a joke, right? Nobody, you couldn't write a script. No, no <laughs> movie production company would take this script because it's not real. And this, it, I mean, imagine you getting on a plastic sled on ice is basically what happened. And this suitcase goes flying down the escalator, takes my wife out, who's at the bottom. So it probably went 30 feet before it hit her, takes her out. She lands on her wrist and breaks her wrist. <laughs> and we have to, um, yeah. You know, we get in the ambulance and we miss our flight and we have some friends in Atlanta that picked up our kids and I'm in an ambulance driving to Grady Hospital where we're trying to figure out what's going on with my wife's wrist. And um, so there was our Good Friday. Okay, right. so there yeah. was <laughs> right. our, you know, um, it was, I, I was, once once they admitted Heather in, I called my pastor, Alex um, Seeley, and I called her and I'm just bawling and I'm just, and I'm just asking her, I'm like, Alex, like, are we cursed? And, Cause I asked her, they're like, listen, I didn't go to seminary. I don't have a theology degree. I don't, I don't know how this stuff works. I, lo- I love Jesus. I love our church. I love her. I love, I love Henry, our pastor. I, I just need somebody to tell me like, after this week, are we cursed? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, did I do something? Did I, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I, I lost all, all kind of semblance of, up, down, left, or right in my in my faith at this moment. I didn't know what, what was happening. And she just said, Carlos, you're not cursed. You know, sometimes life has a way of, you honestly, like, you're just having really shitty weeks. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. and you've just happened to have one. Like, and it just, and, and as impossible as this week feels, n- everybody's going to have a week like this at one point in their yeah. life. That's and cool. that doesn't mean that they're cursed. And I, she's, she's, so she prays for us. And she's, you know, she's like, I'm going to call your kids. I'm going to pray for them because I know they're traumatized. I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you. She actually prays some really strong scripture over our lives. She prays that what the locust has devoured, God would, God would bring back a hundredfold. Like wow. she's, mm-hmm. she's, she's praying pretty f- powerfully. And so I'm feeling a little bit better when I got off the phone with her. Um, and, oh man. And then, so we, I, Heather finally gets back to me. She's like, they, they think that it's fractured in a way that I'm not going to need surgery which was like huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she said, they're going to put it in a splint and let me go. Uh, I said, okay, well, let's get back to Nashville so that we can go to a hand doctor. And she's like, no, we're going to Denver. Like we are flying <laughs> tonight to Colorado. If you know anything about my wife, that's just kind of how she rolls. So I got it. I got, I booked us a flight for eight hours later. And um, as I'm booking the flight, um, Sharon McMahon. Okay. Wait, let me uh, pause you for a second. Okay. okay we'll stop. Let me, <laughs> let me ask you this because now we're going to turn the corner and I, you are a big fan of hope. Yeah. And um, in those moments, 
before while you're in Atlanta, how how are you feeling about hope at that point? Um, in those moments, I'm feeling like hope is a figment of my imagination. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, I have a podcast called Human Hope, <laughs> right. and, I, and 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 I thought I was gonna have to, you know, hang up the podcast, like stop it, like there was there is no hope left. Yeah, there is like zero hope left in humanity. There's zero hope left for my family. Mm-hmm. Again, like I, like the, there's no way this these all these things would happen to just one family. Like, like I just, I was like, this is it. Like what else? Like if we get on a flight tonight, it's going to crash. Like, like that's like the next thing. Right. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. So I'll be honest with you. That's why I called my pastor. Cause I had none left. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't have any left. And then um, as somebody that is publicly fanatical about hope, <laughs> like <laughs> I know for me, like as a professional Christian from time to time, did that like what did that do to your self identity suddenly like finding yourself not sure yeah. what this hope was all about? Yeah. Oh well. Okay. So it didn't do a lot. It didn't shake my identity. Um, only because uh, we have been through crap as a family. Like mm-hmm. we've been we've actually been through a lot harder seasons mm-hmm. than last week. Um, Say, for instance, 2019, when my daughter Sohela gets diagnosed with histoplasmosis, is in the hospital for 21 days, and they didn't know if it was cancer. They didn't know what it was. So we had 21 days of of doctors not knowing what was wrong with my daughter and her being in yeah. the most intense pain you've ever seen in a human. I've literally ever seen a human being being in. And so, uh. like I like like I've got some. I've I've got some capacity. I knew mm-hmm. I knew I had the capacity for deeper, harder hurt. Um, and I've, I've felt myself in a deeper place of feeling hopeless Mm -hmm. and knowing that, that, and I feel like hindsight is always so beneficial when you look at, uh, this is why it's so important to journal. I'm always telling people to journal and things like that, because Mm. I can look back to even more hopeless seasons when I lost my family, uh, because of decisions I made and I, you know, I lost everything. Right. And so, uh, that that was a decade ago. So I can look back and see some pretty dismal, hopeless yeah. situations. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so even as I was feeling hopeless, I know that the truth, you know, I, you know, don't, and again, like, I, I don't want to be preachy here, but this is just true for me that the yeah. truth, the truth of the gospel doesn't depend on how I feel. Mm-hmm. And so, so like, I've got, I like, I just, I had that, like, even though I felt hopeless, I knew that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. So even though my feelings told me I, I was hopeless, I knew that the truth was was that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. And so just knowing that, no, like having that as like fact in my brain carried my soul, right? And in, in, yeah. in these moments. And so um, so it didn't really mess up my identity. You know, as a Christian, it didn't mess up my identity in Christ, my identity in being a hope dealer. But mm-hmm. it did, it, it I did feel like there was no hope. I felt <laughs> like we were about to yeah. get nailed again. I felt like... The plane was going to crash or we were going to go skiing. I was going to break my neck. Like I, it was, it was that man. It was mm-hmm. the sky is falling chicken little running around. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess that kind of answers your question. Like, yeah, it, 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 um, it, I felt hopeless, but I, but I knew in my brain, even though my heart didn't feel it, I knew in my brain that I wasn't. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. <laughs> okay. So Carlos at this point, you're feeling like so many, so many of us feel in our lives or will feel in our lives that, the, the world is against me. Fate is against me. Everything is crashing. I don't know how I'm going to get out from under this. And um, this is that weight of life and tragedy and despair that coming out a year of pandemic, I think a lot of people will relate to on some level, right? Mm-hmm. But then, uh, then light surprised you, right? Then uh, life came out, of, came out of death in a resurrection yeah. Christian-y phrase there, right? But it's a true thing. So how did what happened there? Yeah. So, um, so they're discharging Heather and a couple people had been asking me, um, for my Venmo in my DMS. Right. So a couple of people were like, Hey, and I'm like, man, I ain't giving you my, D- I'm a, I ain't giving you my Venmo. I'm a grown ass man. I can pay my bills. I can, I can hustle. <laughs> I can make, I can make do like, I don't need people giving me their money right now. <laughs> Um, obviously I've got issues to work on myself, you know, more <laughs> that, that, don't that I can talk with my <laughs> therapist on, but you know, I just, I was like, I don't need your money. I don't need a handout. That's not what I do. I give, I give is what I do. I don't mm-hmm. receive, I give. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
a couple of people have found my Venmo by this point. And like, you know, it's actually not complicated. You can really do that if, you, if you're in desperate need of finding somebody's Venmo. And so, you know, I'd gotten like, hey, here's 50 bucks for some a couple of bottles of wine for you and your wife. Here's go buy Lasai an ice cream cone. Go, you know, it was cool. Like I had like, you know, a couple hundred bucks in there. And I was like, man, this is so kind. And um, and I, I said something about it on my on my stories, like, you know, I'm not gonna give you guys my Venmo. You know, I just I can't do that. I'm just I'm just not gonna do it. Well, then Sharon texts me, uh, McMahon. <laughs> And she's like, what's your Venmo? And I was like, I'm not giving you my Venmo. Uh, and she's like, what's your Venmo? I was like, you are not going to tell people my Venmo. Listen, <laughs> friend, you will not do this. And she, she's just like, you can be proud and uh, not give it to me and I will find it or you can give it to me. And whew, that was the beginning of, of something that I, I, I still honestly, we're, we're a week later now. Uh, no, we're not. We're not even a week later. We're like five days later. Mm -hmm. And um, I I still don't understand and grasp what happened. So she yeah. kind of shares my my story with her platform and her her crew. They've they've already raised, you know, almost a million dollars mm -hmm. uh, for all kinds of different organizations and health, you know, health issues for things. And I <laughs> I um <laughs> I pick up Heather um and I pick her up from the ER. She walks out and at this point my phone I actually hadn't seen her post yet. And if you have Venmo on your phone, when when you get a Venmo, the push notification sounds like a, a slot machine at a casino. Like it's <laughs> a ching, ching, right? And so <laughs> so I turn my 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 phone from silent to on and like all of a sudden, I just start hearing cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Every second, okay, every wow. single second, I was hearing that sound for at least five straight hours. Cha-ching, oh. cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And I looked down, I was like, $1, $5, $100, $2, $7, $1, $20, $50. And I'm watching it. I'm watching it. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. And I'm watching oh. over the course of hours, yeah. all, all, of, all of our basement bills get paid for, everything. And then here's the thing. It keeps, she shares it again mm -hmm. and it keeps going. And then it mm -hmm. becomes like a game to Sharon. And then it's, yeah. it's like, <laughs> what like, can we do? Because I, I, I text her, I was, like, I was like, you know, and now I'm like bawling and I text her video message and I'm like, Literally half of Sohala's medical bills from Vanderbilt in 2019 are, are paid for. Um, so she does the math and yeah. she's like, oh, half. Okay. And then she goes <laughs> back. She goes back to her, her crew. Well, we get, we, we take off um, from Atlanta. We fly to Denver. I don't know. Cause I don't have Wi-Fi on the flight. Um, I would have known had it, had it been working, but she continues to like, Hey, by the time Carlos says plane lands, I would love to see all of the medical bills covered. Yeah. Sure and enough. we know yeah. because we were watching yeah. it happen. Right. It was like yeah. one Spectators. more hour, yeah, 30 it. more minutes, guys. Yeah. You like, yeah. she lands yeah. in 10 minutes. Yeah. So awesome. I land <laughs> and my phone starts going off again. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And I look and, uh, and again, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to disclose numbers because, you know, my family's decided to not do that, but I can tell you that not only had, were Sohala's medical bills. Now, and again, you can, you people can do the math themselves. We were uninsured and in the hospital for 21 days. Okay. Wow. So do the, do the math. Oh Not only gosh. were her um, hospital bills taken care of and our basement taken care of and Heather's new medical bills taken care of and our, and uh, uh, Pope's vet vi visits taken care of, wow. but our car payments were taken care of. Our student debt was taken care of our, um, uh, we, we'd taken out a loan to put, build a basement in our, uh, excuse me, build an apartment in our uh, basement under our house. That was taken care of. Like every single ounce of debt that my family had, all the credit card had was completely taken care of. Wow. And I, I, I walked to the bathroom and I'm just weeping as I am trying to say thank you to these strangers, strangers that, mm -hmm. that did this. Now um, I was, okay. So 
right? Everything's taken care of. We, our lives are changed now. And, and when I say change, it's not like we got a million bucks when we won the lottery, but it's more like our debt was taken care of. And you guys know when you have no debt, mm -hmm. your monthly income increases because yeah. you don't have to pay those bills that's anymore. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So like, that's totally. how, how different our life is now. And, um, but I'm, I'm having some struggle with like worthiness yeah. with like, with accepting this. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, wait a second. Like, this is supposed to happen to like people on welfare that are in apartments that need that want to get their first home, not like 40 year old guys and their families with like, I'm fine, you know, but what I had to get to was um, breaking those lies that I wasn't worthy of this as well. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think once I, I wrote a whole book on, on breaking agreements with lies. And so once yeah. I applied my own thinking to my <laughs> Which own is story, the hardest thing to do, yeah. by the way. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like, Oh geez, I got to do this myself. Once I did that <laughs> myself, I was actually giving, I was giving the gift back to everybody that had given to me yeah. when mm -hmm. I was so grateful and appreciative and, yeah. You know, it's so funny because like even even now, like every day, it's been a couple of days now, like once or twice a day, I'll just hear a little cha-ching and someone's like, oh, I'm late to the party. You know, someone <laughs> like like give like five bucks or something like that. And it's I'm just I'm so blown away at the goodness of humanity mm -hmm. that, um, you know, and, and here's the thing. It, that, did that take away the pain? No. Did that take away the 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 pain and the trauma of the loss that we endured? We are still crying. We still hurt. Mm -hmm. Heather is still in pain. We still wonder why did, why mm -hmm. were we chosen to ha have all of this happen to us? Like mm. all those questions are actually still there, sure. but they're not mutually exclusive from mm -hmm. feeling hopeful, right? So you can still yeah. have doubt, have questions, have concern, be wounded, be traumatized while at the same time experiencing the goodness of not only humanity, but what I believe was, is the goodness of God. Yeah. And, um, Amen. And they can both coexist. God is not a feeble God that can't handle our doubts and our mm -hmm. questions and our concerns. Like he can handle it all. He's not, he's not scared of you asking hard questions. What he mm -hmm. does when he, when I ask hard questions, obviously is he comes on the other side and doesn't answer me. He just blesses me. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, like that's just kind of like what it looks like. And so, you know, here I sit, you know, um, and still overwhelmed, still traumatized, still broken, but, but really hopeful and grateful. Wow. Ooh, awesome. Man, you're going to make me run around really? the room. I you're know, preaching. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, seriously. Oh, so, that's so good. As we were watching that kind of unfold and even some things that you said in the days following, one of the things I was struck by um, was the number of people that gave a dollar mm -hmm. or five dollars. And one of the things that we've been kicking around at this table is... Um, the idea that we're actually all of us in our own brokenness or in our own um, out of our own lacking, um, yeah. we are actually the raw materials of the miracles that God is mm -hmm. wanting to do or is doing. Um, and it it makes me think of the story in the Bible of the boy with his loaves and his fishes, and he didn't have much, but yeah. he brought what he had, and God mm -hmm. Jesus yeah. did this amazing thing with it. Yeah, and yep. yet we often think like my I'm not gonna, my dollar doesn't matter. The little that I have to offer, the the little I can bring to the table, isn't going to make a difference. So I'm going to do nothing. Yeah. And yet we get to watch as these people just came to the table with whatever it was that they had mm -hmm. that and participated in an actual mm -hmm. miracle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it was, I, I mean, I'm not a, a, you know, statistician or anything. Like I don't have the data, but it, from just going through my Venmo, um, I would say 97.99% of the gifts were $20 or less. Uh, that that was that was what it, what it was. It was twenty bucks, five bucks, hmm. one dollar, three dollars, and yeah. and wow. and it was a a tidal wave of that that canceled our debt, like mm -hmm. completely canceled our debt. And so you know when people think uh, it's just it's not going to matter if I it really it's my I am I am like your beta test, right? I am yeah. the lab rat where you can yeah. forever say nope. We saw it happen in the lab rat, like it actually it actually happened. The one dollar five dollar things actually change somebody's life. That's Incredible. right. And you guys touched yeah. on something yesterday in your live um, with Sharon about like kind of changing that mindset too about receiving and not feeling like, you know, you want to be the giver, not the receiver. But I loved how that turned around and like 
being a gracious receiver is a gift, right? Oh, so that gosh. what that did for all of those people that gave was mm -hmm. amazing, you know, in and of itself. Yeah. And like, that's a, it creates this lovely community of people that are just participating in your, you know, hope coming back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yes. And, you know, and you know, the thing is, is for me, what I had to get, and it took a bunch of friends um, telling me this, but for me, they keep saying, you know, Carlos, like you, you've been giving of yourself for 15 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. to this audience, to, to the core of like your, your Instagram audience, your mm -hmm. Twitter audience, your YouTube audience, your whatever, uh, your readers of your books, like you've been giving them nonstop every single day. And this was the first time they've ever had an opportunity to give you back something mm -hmm. without without the expectation of them getting something. So anytime yeah. they, that I've asked for anything from my, it's always been like either a book or a course or like something, I'm going to provide you a product, a value and exchange for whatever money it is. And so like they, they don't ever feel like they're giving because that's not right. giving, that's buying. Yeah. And this at this point, they when I allowed them to do that, it was the first time. And that's why I honestly believe that's where half the groundswell was. It it wasn't, you know, and, and the thing is, is it, it wasn't just Sharon's people. There, There's 160,000 of my crew that were yeah, so right. grateful yeah. to be able to give me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm reading in the Venmo's like, you you have taught me so much on racial reconciliation yeah. over yes. the last year. You've poured your blood, sweat and tears on, on helping me be, you know, anti-racist, all these things. You've never asked for anything. This is my way of saying mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and you're right. Like, like to be a happy receiver is is going to be a gift to the giver. And exactly. um, I, I just feel like we all could probably do a better job at that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, so it, good. It really shows like the power of community. And we're we're freaks about community and <laughs> and what it can do for people. And and uh, you've created a community on your Instagram that, you, you know, showed up in this time. But can you tell us a little bit about some of those things that you just mentioned right now, like, like let's back up a little bit into like the summertime mm -hmm. and this year of pandemic and the craziness that's been happening and how politics and exactly. racism and the clash of and, all that. And how you've used your platform to bring that hope to people. Cause it has been yeah. helpful for me. I can say personally, and I think oh, everybody at this table so would much. say the same thing. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, I'd always, I kind of definitely took a big transition and turn this year as far as what I, what I talk about on my platform. Um, and I'd always kind of been like the faith based, like positive dude, right? Mm -hmm. Like you invite me to your church. I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories that are going to make you feel good. I'm going to talk about, you know, Jesus. I'm, I'm going to make you uh, a better Christian. And, um, and which is fine. I, I've, I've loved that part of who I was. I love that calling, but I've, I've watched that calling completely shift this year. I've mm -hmm. watched it um, leave. And, you know, and a lot of, a lot of evangelical Christians have, have left because I'm, I'm not the Bible verse everyday guy anymore on my Instagram, which mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. There's people that are really good at that. I have just been called to talk about, I feel like in a, and I accidentally stumbled upon it, <laughs> but when Ahmaud Arbery was killed, I put up a, a video, how my white, brothers and sisters can help their black friends right yes. now is what it, what it yeah. was called. And so when I put that up in who I may have been March or April of last year, mm -hmm. I had 36,000 Instagram followers when I put that video up and overnight I had 28,000 Instagram followers. Mm -hmm. I lost about 8,000 no, Instagram man. followers wow. the second I put that up. And that was a, that was a deciding point moment for me. Um, I felt called to make that video I offended a lot of people with that video, but I know I helped a lot of people with that video. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm just, I'm, God just told me to keep, nope, this is what you're doing. Keep going. So then I just kind of kept leaning into this space and, uh, and watching more people kind of show up to these conversations and, and honestly watching some people that left that were offended, come back and apologize to me for leaving. Not that I even knew that they left, um, <laughs> but um, apologize and then start learning. And, uh, and then, you know, I was like, well, I wonder if I can, I mean, I feel pretty capable to have hard, hard conversations, not just about race, but about anything. Let's talk mm -hmm. about COVID. Let's talk about Trump. Let's talk about Biden. Let's talk about, you know, whatever it may be. So I start having um, more and more conversations, not negating my point of view. See, I, I would say that some like news outlets or people that are trying to be like fair 
fact-based news sources, smart her news. Sharon says so. A couple of other, you know, I feel like they they're pretty good at keeping their 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 opinion out of things and kind of yeah. giving. Mm-hmm. That's not my thing. Like my 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 <laughs> stick is not. I, you're gonna know how I feel. Like I'm gonna <laughs> tell you my opinion. I'm gonna tell you. But here's I think the beauty that comes in this is that somehow, and I don't know how how, but somehow I'm able to communicate my viewpoints and opinions without ousting the mm-hmm. people that have the opposite opinions in me yeah. from the conversation. Yeah. So that's and kind of magical. Like, really? do you, yeah. what is it? How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess, you know, that that's, I don't know. <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, like, 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 cause I don't necessarily see that. I mean, my, my audience is still pretty, pretty close 50, 50 left, right. And, and I am like a blatant, Biden voting like left leaning Christian and I say it and people mm-hmm. still stick around because they say I, I trust you and you make me feel safe mm-hmm. and you you know I, you know I'll, I'll tell this way I used to work at a church called um, North Point Community Church it's this big mega church in Atlanta mm-hmm. I was on staff there from 2007 to 2010 and I'll never forget Andy Stanley who's a pastor there called me into his office one day I thought I was in trouble because I was, <laughs> mostly was all the time and <laughs> And, and he said, Carlos, I need to tell you something. I said, okay. And he said, the reason why you're one of our best worship leaders at the church isn't because you're a good singer. I said, really? He said, no. <laughs> and he goes, and I've actually never said this to anybody before. And I don't think I've ever seen this before. But when you walk on stage, before you say a word, everybody feels like they're your best friend. Hmm, everybody nice. in the room. And whatever that is, he told me, Whatever that is, that is what you need to grab a hold of. And that is what you need to pour everything into because people feel safe with you. Wow. And you and 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 so when he said it's so funny, he's the only Andy's the only person that's really ever put it in a way that I can describe it. But I feel like that's just a gift. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's just a gift that I've got that um I I can say hard things and everybody because because everybody that follows me, they always say it's so funny. I ask people all the time. They always say it's so weird. But I when I talk about you, I say my friend, Carlos. Yeah, Um, I say I say my friend because without knowing it, like that's just I think how I portray myself is I'm just everybody's friend Mm -hmm. and I'm a friend that they disagree with sometimes and I'm a friend that they agree with sometimes. But it's it's whatever that thing is. Um, I want to really lean into that. And I think yeah. that's what I'm, I've been leaning into over the last year that has allowed people to come in hear maybe a different point of view um, and, uh, and feel, and, and feel like, like, they're, like I'm a safe place for them to yeah. talk about it. You create space for people yeah. um, in yeah. differing opinions. And that's an incredible thing. And, and what um, one of my favorite phrases that I've heard you say on your Instagram is don't stand on issues walk with people. I've even shared that out to yeah. my Instagram mm-hmm. tons of times because it's such a powerful phrase of yeah, a, a picture of what it looks like to create space for other people, differing opinions, yeah. differing backgrounds, etc. Talk about that. Uh, really quick, I have to share this funny story where I was asked my opinion on a very controversial Christian policy, let's say. And I basically responded with that similar idea like, well, I actually I don't think we should make policies about stuff like that. That's more of a conversation. And the guy looked at me and uh-huh. was like, I actually wrote the policy on that for my church. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> well, okay. Well, oh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's amazing. So h- how did you come to that phrase? And and like, uh, how, how have you seen it play out so far? Yeah. Yeah. So I 100% got that phrase from my friend, Mike Ashcroft. Okay. And Mike, Mike Ashcroft is a friend of mine. He's a pastor uh, at Port City Church in Wilmington, North Carolina. And um, he's like on the coast. And it was probably, uh, man, seven years ago where I heard him say that. And I don't even know if he's, if he's ever said it again. Uh, like, I don't know if that was like a thing or right. whatever, or if he just said it. And I was like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> whoa. And, you know, um, so, I mean, Mike's one of the wisest guys I know. So he says things like this all the time. He's one of those people that, that you just want to listen to because he's always saying such wise things. But mm-hmm. when he said that, I just said, that's it. Like that is, that has to be how we handle 2020, 2021, yeah. the climate that we find ourselves in. If we want to see any form of reconciliation happen, 
-hmm. It has to be through not building our ideas on opinions as opposed to um, building our ideas on actually being in relationship with human beings on a daily basis. So, you know, I I tell people all the time, like, don't stand on issues, but walk with people. What does that mean? Well, that means if you are a, and this was, this was more when we were the, in the, you know, intense seasons of 2020, but like, if you are a black lives matter protester, that is like defund the police. Well, I think that's awesome. Uh, if that, if that's what you think, but are you in relationship with any law enforcement officers? Mm -hmm. Are you in relationship with anyone that is an LEO or a police officer? So you can talk about defunding the police all you want, but the police, to be honest with you, they're humans, right? So they are, they are human beings wearing uniforms and badges. So like, we can't talk about the police as if it's some institution. We have to talk about the police as if they are humans. So if you are saying defund the police, okay, well then that's fine. But you can't have that opinion unless until I see you in relationship with the law enforcement officer. If you're a Blue Lives Matter, all Blue Lives Matter, you know, Black Lives Matter is Marxist organization, yada, yada, yada. Well, are you in relationship with a black person that is selling their soul out to uh, going to every march that that feels affected by police brutality Mm -hmm. and by the way policing happens in their community on a daily basis? Are you in relate? If you're not in relationship, then you cannot tell me blue lives matter and black lives matter is a Marxist story. You can't tell me that you, you can have that opinion once you're walking with people. Right. And Mm -hmm. so that's the ticket. That is the game changer. And so, and that's hard. That's really easy for me to say. Uh, That's really easy for me, people to nod to and wear that t-shirt. But at the end of the day, (laughs) that's the hardest thing in the world to actually do, because what that does is um, it it destroys any any sense of um, of of us having figured it out. Like you realize really quickly that you don't that all the opinions that you have on issues like you don't you actually don't have it figured out. You've got talking (laughs) lines, you've got conservative or liberal pundits Mm -hmm. that have given you their, uh, whatever their three points are. And now you can spout them back on Facebook. Like you actually don't know. So when you know, and when you get down in the ditches with the people that are walking, Mm -hmm. you suddenly just aren't spouting things out anymore. Like it's Mm -hmm. just, it's, you're not looking at what other people are saying and tearing that down. What you're doing instead is you're looking at what you're saying and building that up. So what Mm -hmm. happens is you stop, you stop saying, yeah, I'm blue lives matter and black lives matter sucks because because you stop saying that now mm-hmm. you, now you just are talking about why blue lives matter, black lives matter. You, well, you, you're no talk. You're no, no longer talking about just defunding the police. You're talking about, you know, what are ways that you can, uh, that black lives matter can continue to, to grow without looking at policing as simply an institution without seeing that. And, you know, we can talk about abortion. You can talk about LGBTQ rights. You can talk yeah. about all the things that are issues. Mm-hmm. And as soon as people get off their pedestals and start walking with the humans, ooh, I mean, I, I think that's where we're going to see healing as a country. Mm. Amen. Yes. Amen, right? Yes. And that is, yes. one of, that, is one of, <laughs> that is one of the greatest obstacles I think humanity has with faith is when people have taken a place, like, say, say church and their perspective on church. And they have said, this is where we stand without relationship on the other. This is judgment without Mm -hmm. relationship. And when we bridge that gap and begin to love the other and understand the other, we do communicate differently. And that would change the world to open, open doors to people to experience a God of love that they thought was a God of of absolute damnation and judgment. Oh yeah. Right. So like, Mm -hmm. amen to that. And thanks for being you. We have, we have, we have covered so much in this time with you and we're so stoked and thanks for joining us in a time of really you just, you and your family trying to build back to life. Man. Yeah. yeah. Still yeah. being raw in it all too. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. No, you guys are, I appreciate you guys. love what you guys are doing. Love the conversations that you're having. And so, I mean, anytime I can, I can you know, be a voice for you guys. Let me know. Thanks Aww. Carlos. Rock on. Thank you. Hey, thanks before for- we let you go, um, where can people find you and tell us about this thing that I'm holding? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're holding my book, Enter Wild, uh, that came out in June. Um, and the subtitle is Exchange a Mild and Mundane Faith for Life with an Uncontainable God. And what, mm-hmm. what I honestly love nice. about this book is 
um, it, it does tell my story of anxiety and overcoming anxiety and specifically health anxiety, but it can really help with people in general uh, with their general anxiety. I, I was one that, um, you know, there's a lot of people deconstructing their faith, mm-hmm. um, you know, out loud. I, people have always deconstructed their faith. Now, I, I would say that that's become like a, a hot word that people use kind of these days. And I, um, I think that this book really helps people see somebody that has done that and then put put it back together again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And wow. so, um, so yeah, I'm excited. If you want to, if you want to check that out, uh, you can go to enterwild.com. But most of the time, I'm just on Instagram, Loswit, L O S W H I T. I'm also on Twitter, but Twitter, Carlos is like angry Carlos. Instagram, Carlos <laughs> is like happy Carlos. So, like, you know, you want, yeah, make sure you follow me on Instagram before you head over to Twitter so that you like me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we would love, I, one of our immediate follow ups to this is we will do an uncommon good book study on your book and get people together yeah. to have awesome. the conversations because what you give to the world is awesome and God has. God has made you that man. We, mm-hmm. we thank you for sharing yourself with us today. Yeah. Absolutely. And you thanks guys are for awesome. the thanks. continued inspiration. Um, just following you for the last, I don't know, eight months has been so um, life-giving during really mm-hmm. challenging times. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. It, it really means the world, especially when I can see people that are that are tapping like face-to-face on my Instagram. Mm-hmm. It, it means a lot. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, everyone, we hope you enjoyed um, this time with our friend Carlos. And um, before we let you go, we hope that you remember, as always, that you are loved. You are valued. And you belong, friends. Friends.